Welcome. We are in our third lecture for the students in ETC 1000 and if you're watching we're going to learn today just a little bit about preparing data before we can analyze it. Taking you across the full screen, we'll have a look at our PowerPoint for today. So the first task you've got in any business analytical type work is doing some work to describe the data that you've actually got. So we're going to think about descriptive analytics, the task of which is to make sense of what's going on with the data. So the first thing to say though by way of introduction, and we'll think about this more in other videos, is that data can take various forms. We can have either numerical data or categorical data. In other words, the data can be represented by numbers or by categories. And when it comes to numerical data, those numbers can be either discrete or continuous. They can be counts of things like how many people there are in a class, or continuous things like uh, measuring the uh, length of uh, a travel that a truck might have to take to deliver certain goods. When it comes to doing descriptive analytics, I think it's very important for us to make sure that we make a strong connection between the data that we've got and the particular question we're interested in. And unfortunately, sometimes people do this the wrong way around. They start with an analysis of the data and think, well, this is the data I've got, what, what should I be doing with it, rather than starting with the question of interest. Whenever you are faced with a, a business decision or a government policy, whatever it might be, there's something you're interested in knowing about. And your first task really is identifying what that question is, and then, because you want to do things properly, rather than just sort of using opinion, you want to go and actually get hold of the data and uh, make sure that you're connecting that data with the relevance of the question of interest. Now, that's all fine, and we'll look at examples as in different ways and times about how those connections can be made better. But the point of this particular section is to think for a little while about what you might have to do to the data to make sure that it's legitimately useful for the purpose of the question of interest, and particularly how it might need to be adjusted or scaled so that you can describe what you want to describe, so that you're addressing the question. And a particularly important part of this is to ask the question whether different aspects of data for different countries or different time periods or whatever it might be are comparable across those countries or time periods. And we'll see that by way of example shortly. So that's what we're on about here. Here's an example of where we are interested in scaling data, or we need to scale data, because the raw data itself really doesn't give us the true story. This is an example of uh, from 2010 from the World Bank. Here's the website where we got this data from. You can go and have a browse of that yourself and see what you can learn. But it's information about the CO2 emissions of various countries, kilotons per annum. So CO2 emissions are bad for the environment and uh, create global warming and the like. So obviously what we want here is numbers that are as small as possible. This ranks from the biggest emitters uh, down to the least, the smallest, uh, the first 20 or so countries that are in the list. So you can see the biggest emitter is China by a long, long way, but not too far behind is the United States and, and so on down the list as we go. Uh, where's Australia? Here it is, somewhere down in the top 20. Um, so uh, we have significant emitters, but not right up there with the biggest of the lot. So looking at that data, you'd have to say, well, the poor old Chinese are doing a pretty lousy job. They've got some massive emissions. But don't forget China also has about one-sixth of the world's population. Um, five times the population of the United States or thereabouts. So of course then we can expect that they have more emissions. But really to make a fair comparison here, what we need to do is not look at emissions in total, but look at emissions per person. So what we've done is take the previous data and divide by the number of people. So the 8.2 billion has been, uh, has been, million rather, has been divided by the population of China and so on. And then we get data now, which is no longer killer tons in the previous case, but just tons per capita. And this tells us how much emissions there are per person in these, in these countries. And now, and again, we've ranked them from the biggest emitters to, uh, the, to the smallest, there's 20 or so countries listed here. So the biggest emitter is now Qatar. Uh, in fact, you can't even see China on the list. It's way further down. Uh, still, the United States comes in as a fairly large emitter, although not right at the top of the list. Australia is in a fairly similar position to what it was before as a, as a uh, you know, one of the top 20 emitters, but not at the very worst of the lot. Um, some countries that you might not necessarily expect to be there are indeed listed on the, on the top of the half a dozen or so 
from uh, different parts of the world. So a very different story to what we told in the previous case there. So sometimes it may actually be appropriate to use the raw emissions data, not the scale data. Because after all, if you think about the emissions, it's what, what sort of matters to the environment is not uh, is the, the total amount of emissions, full stop. It's not just the uh, emissions per capita. It's the amount of CO2 in the environment that's causing uh, the global warming, etc. So we do care about the raw data, this number here. And we do see that if we're going to make an impact on policy, that even though China is not a huge emitter on a per capita basis, we do need to try and prevent China's emissions from growing at the very least and perhaps try to see it decline. And similarly with the other big emitters like the United States and India. So there's an element time at which we want to concentrate on the total data. But if you're actually looking at a country to try and say, well, how are you performing? Are you a big emitter or not? It's probably fairer to look at per capita emissions and take some account of size of the country. So the answer is it depends on what kind of case you're trying to make with the data. What's your question of interest? Which are the appropriate ones you should use? But it is very important to be aware of what can go wrong with just looking at the raw data and why at times it's important for you to scale the data. Now that's just one example of scaling of data where we did it per person, per capita. But we may, have, may want to scale data in lots of other ways. We may want to calculate percentages, proportions, rates of return. Uh, per hectare if you're looking at agricultural productivity, per employee if you're looking at uh, problems of complaints that you have from customers, per dollar invested if you're looking at some kind of uh, rate of return, etc. So many different ways in which we can obtain relative measures. Now, one particular one I want to focus on for a little while now is adjusting for inflation or price differences. And this is a particular issue if you're trying to look at a series of data that, that changes across time. Uh, and the data itself might evolve in part because um, you know there's been a change in the nature of the thing that you're measuring, but also it may actually just evolve simply because the prices of the, of the products that make up this data have evolved as well. And, and that's not necessarily giving you a true picture of what's really going on. The example we've got here is uh, gross domestic product in Australia. And uh, here is a graph of what we're talking about. So gross domestic product rec represents the total economic product or activity of the Australian economy. So it's our total output or income or consumption, etc., in the economy. And you can see on a per quarter basis it grew in from around 1990 from about the 200,000 level, this is millions of dollars per quarter, up to well over 700,000 by 2013. So four times the kind of jump, nearly four times the, the increase over 20, a little over 20 years. Are we really four times more productive in 2013 compared to 2000, to, to 1989? Not really, because some of that increase in uh, the total economic activity is true um, increase in productivity. We are producing more goods, we're providing more services, etc. But a fair bit of it is not like that, a fair bit of this increase is due to increases in prices. So if we, for example, produce 100 units of a good and each of them sells for $100, then we've got 100 times 100, which is $10,000 worth of output. If we increase the price to 110, then, but don't still only produce 100 units, then now the total productivity is 11, the total production is $11,000. So we've seen the total, the total increase from 10,000 to 11,000, 10% increase. But in fact, we're producing no more. We're still producing 100 units. And that's simply because the, the increase that we observed is all driven by the price. Now, in a series like this, some of the increase is driven by true increases in product, production in output, and some of it is driven by increases in price. And what we want to do is extract out the effective price so we can identify the real increases in just the sort of quantities produced. So we do that by taking the original actual data, which is the dollar value of the series actually measured at a point in time, which has as its components, if you like, it's got a, a, a quantity effect. How much of the stuff do we actually produce? And a price effect. How much is the price of that good sold for? Modify those two together, you get the total output. 
And if you add that up across all the products we produce, you get the GDP. That's what we're measuring there. What we're doing in the second case is constructing a real value of the series. So that's called nominal or actual or current prices, GDP or anything else. We can extract out the effective price to produce a real value of a series or a constant prices value of a series. And the way we do that is if we knew what the prices did over the last 20 years, we can divide out the price effect so that the only changes that happen in this series are due to increases in quantities. If we knew all the prices, we simply divide by price and we just get the quantity effect. And that's what real or constant prices. So that's why it's got the term constant prices in there because we we keep we get rid of the price effect so that it's as if the prices had remained constant throughout the whole of that period that we're looking at. So how do we get that? Well, we need a price series. We need some idea about how prices have evolved over time. And the most common price series, there are many price series, and depending on what you're actually measuring the price of, but the most commonly used one is what's called the consumer price index. In the case of the consumer price index, we're taking a weighted average of prices of all sorts of consumer items uh, across the whole of uh, the, the country, different capital cities. And what we do is we collect prices on all sorts of goods and uh, services, and we average those according to how much of them people buy. So, for example, if you buy lots of bread and milk, then they get a, a high weight. If you don't buy very much of um, DVDs, then the price of DVDs going up will have a low weight in the CPI, and so on. So we end up with a, a, an average of all the prices of all the consumer items that people consume, weighted by the relative importance of those items. Then we index it to equal 100 in the base period, and that gives us something called the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So then to construct our real value of our series, we take the nominal value of the series and we divide by that Consumer Price Index. So in terms of that little simple example in the writing I've got here, we take GDP, which is well, a nominal series, which includes both the quantity and the price effect. We divide by the price effect here, and that gives it a real value of the series, which is now really just capturing quantity effects. Let me show you what inflation data looks like. First of all, here's the consumer price index as it's recorded for the last for a recent uh, few years. Uh, it's just ticking over and if we were to uh, take percentage changes in the consumer price index, we'd be getting measures of inflation. So when people talk about inflation in the economy, that's what they're doing. They are taking the consumer price index values and taking percentage changes in those. What I'll actually do is just flick you across to what the data looks like in a spreadsheet here. So this is that consumer price index data. I'll make it a little bit bigger for you that we're talking about. See it just scrolls its way down here with lots of different values. And next to it is the inflation rate. So for example, inflation rate up to December 2012 was it's December 2012, 2.2%. Now we calculate that, it's an annual inflation rate, so we calculate that inflation rate there by taking the CPI in 2012, December, comparing it to the CPI in 2011. So we take, if you can actually see that, the formula, if I just highlight that cell, you see the formula up here, A268, which is this number here, minus 264, which is this number here, the December a year ago, divided by 264 and express that as a percentage. So in that year, on average, prices increased by 2.2%. That's what the CPI is all about. Now what we do is we take the nominal GDP figure over here, this column, and we divide it by the consumer price index to get the real GDP using that formula that's in the notes. So in December 2012, see the formula, formulas. Here's the nominal GDP, we divide by 183 and we get the real GDP, just like that. Let me just take you back to the PowerPoint. So when we do that, so that's applying this formula here, when we do that, that's what the real GDP does. You'll notice the real GDP goes up much more slowly, that's the red line. Oops, turn my pen on for you. It's real GDP, and that's nominal. It goes up much more slowly than nominal GDP because the only increases you see in real GDP 
are true increases in the quantity produced, whereas the nominal GDP increases because of price rises as well. So it gives you a much clearer picture about what's happening in the economy. So it's true that the economy has still grown from a, just under 200 to just under 400, so it's nearly doubled or about doubled in that period. And that's a much clearer picture of how much economic growth has been improvements in productivity. Just a point to notice, you'll see that nominal and the real GDP are uh, very similar in the first year down here. That's the year in which the consumer price index had its base equal to 100. So it kind of makes sense. If the CPI is equal to 100, nominal divided by that will give you what the, that nominal divided by 1, which means that nominal and real should be equal to each other. And that's what's going on down there. Uh, just a little footnote, uh, there's actually seasonal patterns in this data which I've cleaned out so that it looks a bit nicer and smoother. Um, we'll come back and talk about that another time perhaps so that real, the actual GDP data doesn't quite look like this, it's just simplified slightly. Alright, so I hope you've learnt a little bit about scaling and all of that. I'll just take you back to uh, finish up and uh, make the observation that now we have learned about scaling, we're all set to take some tools of descriptive analytics and do some analysis of our data. Thanks.